Welcome to Ruminations on Tony's Tall Tales. I'm your host, Anthony Pavlich. Thank you, dear listeners, for joining me today. So let's start off with a little script update. <laughs> um, so yeah, as um, I've expressed, I'm currently working on a spec screenplay, uh, trying to get that knocked out. Um, I honestly can't remember when the last update I provided and actually what the, the total was, but um, currently right now I'm sitting at 96 pages uh, as I look at the, uh, the screenplay right now. I think that's not that much different than the last update I provided. I know a uh, goal I had set was I've been trying to cr- cross um, 100 pages um, uh, for a bit now and just still not hitting that mark. Uh, we'll talk a little bit of some of the things that I've been running up against. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it, it's that thing where I feel down, you know, I, it's, it's easy for me to get down on myself. And I know, you know, a lot of, uh, you out there probably as you're doing your own journeys, uh, might not even be writing, you know, we, we put these expectations on ourselves that make it, uh, difficult sometimes when we feel that we, uh, don't hit that mark. And we've talked about it before, you know, um, expectations and also to this idea about success should look a certain way, you know, in our uh, productivity driven uh, society. Uh, it's very hard to, to feel that we are actually performing the way that we either think that we should be or even pressures and other societal norms say that we should be, you know, performing at a certain way. So it's very easy for us to get down and feel like we're a failure or we're not living up to our potential. And, you know, it's tough, you know, because then when we perpetuate that story and that cycle, it's very hard for us to get back and, and just keep grinding, you know, and because it is, it is work. It's not every day is not going to be, you know, rose petals and and lavender and bird singing and stuff like that. It, it's there's going to be some days where you just don't feel like it uh, and <laughs> you're going to feel uh, blocked. You're going to feel uninspired, unmotivated. Um, and it's OK. It's normal. Um, it's fine. It does not define your. Um, your view of yourself and it doesn't just it doesn't define you as a person so um embrace it um notice it and just you know and it's okay to sit down and and another thing too it's okay to feel bad it's okay to feel not great you know some days um just sit with it you know acknowledge it breathe into it and then you know, pick yourself back up and keep striving and it'll, it'll, it'll work out. And, you know, and the thing is too, is one of the things I, I, I consider too, 96 pages, that's 96 pages that never existed before, you know? So at least, uh, there is some sort of progress. And again, you know, I've discussed this in other episodes. It's a, it's a marathon. <laughs> it's not a sprint. It's going to take some uh, some time and some work. And shout out because this reminded me of um, had a great uh, conversation with um, Optimus over at the uh, Retro Futurist Culture podcast, uh, part of the Ruminations Radio Network, and we discussed uh, last week Tenant. And it's incredible because we were talking about it took Christopher Nolan seven years to write that script. Uh, think about it. This is a uh, 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 an award-winning director and writer and producer, and it took him, you know, a long time to uh, generate that script. And you know, it's it's taken a long time too for his other scripts. But you know, it's again, it just reiterates that point that it's it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's going to take some time if you want it to 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 just to get it done, but also to be you know of of quality. Um, so again, don't beat yourself up too, too much or too hard. Um, it's okay. Um, so in that point, um, one of the things that I noticed when I was going through it, while I was getting a little bit, I, I kind of got stuck at a certain point 
with where it was at. Because then what I noticed when I went back to review is that um, Bond was showing up in multiple scenes uh, or in, in new scenes. And I found myself when reviewing that it was just a regurgitation of the same information that we had uh, gotten in the previous scene. And there wasn't anything that really was propelling him to face an obstacle, to meet an obstacle of, of what it was that he was trying to accomplish, what his intent was. Again, you guys know I'm a big proponent of uh, obstacle and intention. Um, that is what creates the uh, dramatic um, tension in the scene, but also the, um, uh, the conflict. So I was noticing that in the next scene that I would write, it, he, he was getting to another place, but the information was almost the same. It was, and also, too, he wasn't facing uh, a real threat. And I've noticed this when I try to deconstruct some of these big action piece movies. Uh, one that I'm really obsessed with right now is um, The Last Mission Impossible. Um, and they just they do such a great job of it's such a complex uh story but man they do a pretty good job of getting ethan hunt to the next place that he needs to do but they throw so many great obstacles at him and all his plans like right off the bat the first scene where his plan just goes completely wrong and then he has to adapt and um, it, it, it almost seems like there's constantly that, um, that conflict that again, the obstacle he, he's going for a specific intention, the plan goes wrong. He's faced with another obstacle. He's got to go, he's got to figure out, overcome it, um, makes it work, gets to the next stage to the next point to progress the story faced with an obstacle, uh, insurmountable odds seemingly. Um, and it's just, it's a fascinating, fascinating movie. Uh, when you deconstruct it like that from a, from a writing perspective. And it's so intricate. There's so many different layers with that plot that I keep gravitating towards it. So, and, and I feel like with my Bond script that there's, there's an essence of that. Like there's some co very deep complexity with what I'm trying to uh, tell. Because also to, you know, I want to I wanna make audiences um, excited and it be thrilling and you know i have like some of the great action set pieces that bond films are known for but i'm trying to tell a very emotional story with james bond you know I'm trying to take him into a place that he hasn't been before um but that is still relatable um and then also to because of the time and place that we are in now how do you present bond in a way that doesn't play to the same you know tropes that were in previous films and so i'm fascinated with trying to put this puzzle together and you know i'm still as like a a, a writer who's still trying to find his way who's still trying to hone his craft um it's difficult because i'm trying to learn how to write but then i'm also trying to still tell a story and how, how to best convey that story in the parameters of an action film, which is a little bit ironic, you know, it's, 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 the irony is not lost <laughs> on me with it. Um, so I was, I was, I was noticing this problem. I've been thinking a lot about how to get back to the fundamental of what is it Bond is faced with, and then what is it that he wants or needs, and how to make it compelling. And and I've noticed too with with set pieces. Uh, especially these big budget films, the sets, the scenes aren't very long. You know, you're not sitting in these scenes for very many pages. So you've got to provide information. You've got to present the obstacle very quickly. You have to allow your protagonist to um, move to to, but give them things that are actionable. You know, like your script. You have to remember it's a visual presentation. So, you know, we had this conversation. Um, can't remember who it was with, and I'm actually trying to think of the film now. Um, 
but the, the question was essentially like, what was that written into the script? Do you provide a lot of exposition and, you know, you know, set, set the scene up and you don't, it's, it's, you really have to distill it because you have to think about too, who's reading this script. A lot of times the people that are reading the script aren't your audience. You know, it's executives, it's producers, it's going to be other people that within the first 10 pages, they're going to know whether this is a professional script or if this is a script written by an amateur. Um, because you have to also think and remember that they read hundreds and hundreds of scripts. So they already have a strong sense of what works, uh, what are the pitfalls, what are the mistakes. Um, so you kind of have to think about that too. So a lot of times, you know, unless you're established and you have a clear established um, line of, you know, writing, directing, producing, um, you really want to distill your set, um, your scenes and your action uh, very sparsely. And you want to just give like the most important details. And <laughs> I think there's that, that beautiful adage, you get in and get out. You know, I remember when I was training in boxing, my coach would always say, don't admire your work. You get in, you get out. You know, you, you don't sit there. You don't, you don't, you don't get cute. You don't get fancy. You just you get in there, do your job and get out. It's the same with your scenes. You want to get in, you want to get out. You don't want to, you know, uh, linger too long because, because again, you want to, you, you're, you're presenting a story that you want to be compelling and engaging. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I've been trying to get back to and, and just remember, um, because I think that's going to help with some of this, these, um, issues that I'm running into. So one of the things that I was thinking about is, um, I remember there was a great, um, story about Shonda Rhimes, I believe, or uh, some, another author where, they had written maybe like a hundred. No, it was actually, it was a, it was a, it was a writer that um, written an entire, maybe a hundred pages of a screenplay or had written a whole screenplay. And then they were talking with the director and basically ended up just chucking the whole thing and having to start, start all over from scratch. And that's, <laughs> if that's what the story calls for, you got to be okay with that. So I was trying to go back to the basic. Um, beginning and think about okay, what what would probably what would what would make the most sense of getting Bond in the situation that would present him with a a, a very big obstacle in, in in the way of what he needs to accomplish. And originally, how I had set it up, but then also too would maybe help where I feel he's getting stuck in 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 later scenes. And I made kind of a change. I almost kind of went back to an outline, you know, back to the outline and tried to restructure the outline. And I came up with an idea that I think that might, might be beneficial and, and making something happen much sooner than I thought would happen much later in the script. And so I'm trying to incorporate that now and see if, that, um, if that's going to help. And it, thus far, very, very early on, it seems that it, it has. Um, it's getting bond. It's getting bond quickly into the action. Uh, we we set we set the stage up very quickly, and it also gives him reason to uh, develop a relationship with the character early on. That um, I kind of feel like is going to be beneficial for a twist that I have later, um, and also to provide him with the means of why he needs to do the thing that he needs to do. Um, so I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about it. So hopefully on my next update, um, I have some more details to, to share and, um, you know, provide, get over that, that 100 page hump, man. <laughs> like I'm really, I'm so close and I'm really, you know, I'm very, I'm very excited to get over that hump. So, um, cool. Today, um, is chapter, uh, is is aptly cha uh, titled Chapter 6, uh, The Writer's Toolbox, uh, because I wanted to kind of highlight uh, a tool that I've been using in this process um, and share my experience with it, but also to you know, some of the features of, of it that anybody that hasn't used it or know about it 
um, might be might find helpful. So, Final Draft is a very powerful software application that many writers use uh, for generating screenplays for television, film, and also you can use it for everything now. You can use it for comic books. There's templates for video games, stage. Um, so it's a very versatile tool now for uh, all kinds of, of mediums. And um, on Final Draft's site, there they they say that you know it's you know Final Draft's been around for 25 years. Uh, it's con it's the industry standard and it's the market leader in screenwriting software. Um, it's it's used by over seven or by 95% of film and television produ productions. And it's just, it's kind of the first go-to choice uh, for, you know, professional writers, aspiring screenwriters, producers, directors, and basically a lot of different people in production. Uh, it was founded in 1990 um, because uh, the two co-founders uh, recognized that, you know, just Hollywood in general uh, lacked a uh, word processing, you know, um, software that was capable of almost in a sense, automating the process of what a lot of, you know, um, methods and ways that were done by hand still at that time. Um, so it led to the creation of Final Draft. Um, and it's won, you know, many awards. It's gone through many uh, updates and revisions. And it's, it's actually a, an extremely powerful and it's a great tool. Um, so yeah, some of its benefits are, so currently Final Draft is in version 12. Uh, when I purchased it, um, I had purchased it in 2017, so very recently. Um, and it's interesting too, because I was trying to think back, what, what was I doing to construct scripts? I think I was using a, a, a program that was like a free, a free version for a while. Uh, because one of the things is with Final Draft and other um, screenwriting software is that it provides a format that is basically still to this day considered the standard uh, for the industry. Um, and that includes the, the sizing of the margins, the, the font that is used. It's still the same font that has been used uh, almost back to the heyday of, of um, motion pictures. And just everything about the, the layout and the format is what is great about screenwriting software because it's all preset. So you don't have to sit there and go into a word processor and say, okay, my margins have to be X amount on the left and the right. Uh, I have to have a certain amount of margin on the top and the left. I have to have this font. I have to have this specific indentation. Um, I have to have these sort of uh, screen heading is supposed to be a certain way. Uh, dialogue is supposed to be character name, like everything, you know, uh, uh, capitalization, like all of that is already set. So right out of the box, you're, you're getting a software that is um, configured to the industry standard. So you know that when you're writing your script, you can just focus on writing the, 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 the script itself and focus on the story and not have to worry about the, 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 the configuration of it, which is fantastic. Uh, so I was using free software um, previously, which did a lot of that, but obviously there's been new bells and whistles and features added to newer versions. And then now it's become, you know, like you're having to pay you know, for, for a lot of the stuff. There's still some free ones out there. If I can, uh, I'll, I'll make sure I'll, I'll try to research them, make sure if they're still available, I'll link them in the show notes. Uh, Final Draft is a paid program. Um, it's kind of pricey if you're just getting into it. Uh, it's going to, but expect that it's going to cost you at least a couple hundred bucks. Um, you can, if you are in uh some sort of uh, educational program, like if you're still in school or you got uh, some sort of uh, program that you can utilize for a discount. So you can get a discount off it if you're a student. Um, that's great. Also, too, you can, um, when, you, when you're upgrading to a new version, it is less than if you bought the 
full version straight out. So the upgrade, for example, when I upgraded, um, I paid the upgrade price, which was uh, just shy of a hundred dollars, and it wasn't too bad because, uh, again, like I mentioned, I was on version uh, in 2017. I bought in version 10, and um, which was fine for me because, uh, like I said, it was just I was kind of like just okay, let's let's just dive into it. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about it, and I was like, like if I if I'm gonna get serious about this, let me just get you know, some serious software. Uh, great. I, I have no regrets about the purchase. Um, I've enjoyed using it quite a bit. Uh, so version 10. So that's like, yeah, it's crazy. It's four years that has passed. So I felt comfortable with doing an upgrade because there were some new features, specifically about one or two that I really wanted to try out and that I thought would be helpful uh, going forward. So version 12, uh, has what's called an enhanced beat board. Uh, and beat board is a very interesting um, feature because it's essentially, you might think of it as like the traditional idea of the, the, the note cards or the index cards on the cork board. It's kind of like that, but it's, it's a little bit more um, scalable where it's, it's basically, you can almost think about it like an unlimited cork board. You can organize your ideas in a very customizable and a visual way. So you can play around with boxes, you can color code them, you can resize them, you can connect the beats um, using what they call flow lines. Um, you can send these beats directly to your script for easy access. So it's kind of a powerful, um, you can almost kind of think of it like a scrapbook. So you can put all kinds of stuff in there and you kind of, kind of, you can kind of make a yeah grand visualization uh, a beat board of, of of your entire story um, another feature is this uh, what they call the new outline elements or outline editor so what this allows you to do is you can transfer that beat board to an outline editor for high level outlining i haven't been able to play with this as much just because i'm still trying to figure out how to use it um, it seems really interesting but i still haven't been able to grab my head around um, integrating it into my own workflow. And then you can send your outline to script using uh, what they call those outline elements. So um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. The way they, do, they, they break it out is that you've got these multiple lanes where you can organize your screenplay structure. And then you can even adjust the size of beats in that outline editor for like kind of like a bird's eye view of your entire script. Yeah, it's very, it's very um, uh, incredible, and I'm still trying to figure some of that out. Uh, script notes is another feature uh, for this new version. Uh, you can add comments to your scripts as, as ideas come to you, so you don't necessarily have to put them in your script, but you can make them almost like a comment, like in, in, Word, you know, like in a Word document where you can comment something. And... Uh, it allows you to kind of flag a, a note that you can go back to later and either it'll reference for something that you need to research or look up or try to include later on in your script later. Um, one of the things that's really cool is I, I still work in tech, so night mode is a big thing with uh, a lot of the tools that we use. And it's kind of a running joke with uh, some of the IT uh, groups is that you know, the first feature is always uh, is night mode available. <laughs> and they've also included a focus mode, which so night mode uh, inverts your screen to cut down on the eye strain. And then focus mode uh, el eliminates unwanted distractions. So I've really enjoyed it. I, I've enjoyed the, uh, the night mode. It's just it, it looks slick. You know, it's it's cool. Kind of makes me feel a little bit more Bon esque. <laughs> so. That's, that's really nice, get that darker theme. Um, one of the interesting features, too, that I'm really, I have not played around with it, but I'm very fascinated by, is speech to script. Um, speech to script customizes Mac's dictation feature. So if you have a Mac and you're using Final Draft on Mac, you can utilize this feature so you can write your screenplay without ever touching the keyboard. And I might try this out like if if i do before the next uh episode i will definitely let you know how that works 
Um, you can insert images. Um, uh, Smart type allows you to cut down on keystrokes by auto filling commonly used names, uh, locations, and more. And this is what's uh, what's been pretty cool is it's in a way kind of helps speed it speeds up some of these features because um, again I can very quickly go between different um, uh, elements and and, and Elements are, are what Final Draft and also just the industry and standard calls um, parts of your elements of your script. So you've got, you know, your your scene heading, which is going to be, you know, your in, in, interior, exterior uh, locations. Your action, which follows your uh, scene headings, uh, what kind of action uh, that you're presenting on screen. Uh, your character is another element. Um, Parathetical uh, um, is another element. Dialogue obviously is another element. So uh, transition. There's others. There's like transition, shot, um, and general. And what's really great about Final Draft is you can very quickly tab or enter into these different elements. So you don't have to. Again, it, it's all about allowing you to focus on the story at hand and what you're trying to do to visualize your your ideas. So it's really cool. So I can quickly tab over into um, my, like, you know, if I'm going from an action to a character, um, if I start typing the character's name, um, it'll automatically provide me almost like an autofill option for a character that I've been using. So Bond is obviously in there. So I can quickly go to Bond and then immediately go into his dialogue. So it's extremely effective, extremely powerful. So again, you're, you're not having to say like, wait a minute, I need to tab over this many times. Okay, now I need to center it. I'm doing a, a character. It's like, no, you know, action. Camera pans revealing James Bond. He wears shades and is dressed in dark tactical gear. He looks over to the driver and then boom, Bond, you know, dialogue. Um, so it's very quick. It's very easy. Uh, it's very elegant. Um, what was another thing that I wanted to highlight? Oh, so one of the big things that um, I wanted to check out because what was what was new, and I think it came out in version eleven, but obviously since I had ten, I it came out in the next version. I didn't have this. Um, was there's there's an actual view now in Final Draft uh, called Index Card Script. So what this is, this is really cool because essentially this is that same um, idea of the index core index cards on a cork board. And so what it does is it lays out this view of all your index cards of every single scene that you have. And you can basically rearrange the index cards and it will change the order of your script, of your actual script. Now, the only thing it will not let you do is change what is in the index card. The only thing that you can adjust is your, uh, your um, scene heading. But you can't change anything like the action or the dialogue or the characters in that index card. But... Um, it will provide you the way of moving around. So you could, in theory, basically, you could set up a, a script traditionally how you probably would do it in, in by hand with your index cards. You know, a lot of people, would, they, would, they would write out index cards, you know, very basic scenes, uh, basic actions, and then they would put them on the cork board so they could visualize it and then move those index cards around to start getting a, 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 a structure of how they feel like the story is going to be told. And now you can do that with Final Draft, which is really cool. Um, so that was something that I, because I had never done the traditional, I, I had tried with one project and I just wasn't very good at it. And also too, I was, I was still learning about uh, screenplay structure and stuff like that. Um, but I'm really interested on using it maybe in the beginning of another project. I might use the rearrangement um, for this project, but I definitely want to look at possibly starting 
a project with those index cards in the beginning. Uh, and I might see if that's better for my workflow. Uh, what there is, is another view that is in there is index cards summary. So this is where you can put in a summary of, of, of the index cards that are already built out based on your script. Um, the only thing I'm still trying to figure out is if there's any sort of um, movement where I can get information from an index card into uh, a, a script cleanly. Um, but I think that might be because one of the features that they had, as we discussed earlier, was the, um, the outline. Um, you can bring um, elements into your script from the outline. So I think they might be trying to utilize that because, um, yeah, I'm not too sure if it's just it's more of a, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, actually. So I'll have to look into more of that if, if that's why they, they were really pushing, not pushing, but they were making that, that um, feature predominant. Um, so then that way you could still have some flexibility with the index cards, but it wouldn't, wouldn't totally, because I could definitely see it how if you were to change information in your index cards and rearrange them, you know, it could create maybe some sort of, uh, you know, controlled chaos, <laughs> or it could be very hard to, to find your way. But if, if, if you've got this over overview outline that you could see, in relationship to your script, that that might be more powerful tool um, and more effective. So, yeah. So, uh, final draft. Um, I'm trying to think if there was any other big. I besides those those few features, those were really what kind of drove me to to make the jump. And like I said, the the bit that I've worked with, I only I've only got the upgrade about two weeks ago. Um, the little bit that I've played around with, it's yeah, it's great. I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm really trying to utilize the beat board a little bit more. Um, I'd started it um, in the beginning with this script, and it's helped, but I don't think I've leveraged the full power of it. And I think um, I can definitely, you know, utilize it a little bit um, more strongly, uh, even now probably, uh, to help me with some of the. Because yeah, as I'm going back and kind of doing some rearranging, that um, I'm gonna have to. Yeah, make some changes. Um, there's also a scene view, which is really great. Uh, it breaks down all of the scenes in your script. Um, so you've got that, again, that ability to bird's eye view, so quickly scan. Um, some of these things, too, are really great when you start probably getting into production. Um, there's collaboration um, features, so there's track changes. Um, so yeah, there's even levels that I haven't gotten to, um, that are just, you know, extremely powerful tools with this software. So I, as in, in terms of any sort of, you know, cons or things that it doesn't do well, I honestly, I think there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of disadvantage of, of not using it. Um, Again, like I said, Final Draft has been around for a long time now. Um, I might not particularly like the way they do their upgrade path, but, you know, they're a business, and I get it. And, you know, it takes a lot of, you know, as, as, as a person who works in, in IT, I understand the amount of effort and time that it takes to, to build out new, new software and new processes. So it's not, it's, it, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to be, free <laughs> and i understand that you got to get paid for your work but also to it takes time and effort to develop these new features and to keep up to date with all the, the technology that's constantly changing um it but it is pricey um i think it's a thing too where like you you can start off and like i said this the first iteration of final draft that i got it it did just fine for me you know for for many years so it's not a thing where you have to constantly update every year. Um, get the base package, and it'll serve you well. So make the investment um, if you can. And I, I've I've been finding uh, great benefits out of it. So I don't find 
there to be any disadvantages with not using it. Um, I'm, in, I'm enjoying it, and I'm really excited to delve, uh, become you know, more proficient at it um, as time goes on and as I use it for more and more projects. Um, again, I think also, too, part of what I am very conscientious of is I still am personally trying to find my own writing process in terms of my workflow. And so the, the tools are only as good as, as the person using them. And um, once I become a more proficient writer, much more experienced, um, I think that I will be able to leverage the features to their full advantage. But then also, too, I don't get too hard on, you know, technology that doesn't, yeah, things may frustrate, frustrate me at times, but, you know, I know that there's, there's always a workaround because I have to do that in my, my job anyways, you know, fine, you know, what just, let's just make, let's figure out a way to make it work for the time being, uh, just so that it doesn't Im impede our workflow too, too much. And then we'll find a long-term solution, you know, a little bit later. Um, so yeah, and one of the questions I, I kind of tongue-in-cheek, you know, posed in in the show notes is uh, the most pressing question: Will it make me a better writer? <laughs> and no, again, it goes back to the idea: uh, the the tool is only as good as the person using it, and it's it's not going to make you a better writer. It will, if, if anything that I've experienced thus far to this point is that what makes you a better writer is writing. And as long as you're utilizing all of the resources and the tools that are available to you to write, then that will make you a better writer. And I guess, you know, Technically, it will make you a better writer if you're using it to write. Um, because if you're showing up every day um, or as often as you can, and you're just, you know, even if, it, see, the thing is like, that, that's kind of probably one of the, the, the gist of what, you know, I'm, I'm rambling, but that's probably the gist of what I'm trying to say is that it's okay too to stumble through something. It's okay not to know completely 100% what you're doing <laughs> like there's stuff that today i've been in technology for decades um i want to say i've been using computers for 20 plus years and i've been working in it support for many 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 years and i still am constantly finding stuff that i don't know about you know and i've got a proficiency of figuring thing out things out and I, I have what i like to call uh good i have extremely good tech juju so uh i can stumble around you know if if i don't know something or if i'm just getting introduced to a new system a new tool um i can stumble through it and that's okay you don't have to know something 100 percent in order to utilize it to benefit you just take what it gives you, learn it, and that that's why that's why these these cliches are cliches. Practice makes perfect. But also, two, the more you practice, the better you'll be able to um, be. The better you'll you'll get. Um, so and it's just like any tool. The more you use it, the better you'll be able to, to utilize it. And that, in essence, will make you a better writer because you'll be writing. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to live by those words. Um, so that's all I wanted to present today. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate you joining me today. Um, it's uh, great to, to share, if not only to express almost like a, a living journal <laughs> of what I'm going through as, as a writer. Um, hopefully it helps, helps you. Um, maybe it's entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, um, but it's also too. It's a great way. I, I don't know if I've expressed this in previous episodes, but I, I think it's a great way to 
hold myself accountable um, to, to, to keep showing up, keep striving, keep um, just doing. And um, I hope to have something out of that. And I think I will. Uh, so thank you so much. You are all wonderful, wonderful people. Um, you've been listening to Ruminations on Tony's Tall Tales, a production of Ruminations Radio Network. Uh, please take this moment to subscribe, rate, and review our show, and we would love to connect with you on social media at Tony Tony's Tall Tales. You can also visit RuminationsRadioNetwork.com for additional great shows such as Retro Futurist Culture and Cinephile Hissy Fit. Um, and many, many more. And for all of your burning questions and passionate feedback, drop us a line at ruminationsradio at gmail.com. Until next time, take care. Cheers.